not a, I'm getting, in a certain sense you're right, but you're not really right. I mean, that's not really, yes, Sarah. Again, you're both saying that there are different parts. This is for you, I'm sorry. This is for you, and this is for you. Uh, but uh, you're saying something correct, but it's not getting it. And it's a simple, like, uh, straight on answer. Yes. No, all, all, you're, all, you're all mentioning things that belong in the final formula the alpha, the, the sample size, the variance. Those are the three things that belong in the formula. But that's not the criticism why this is wrong. What was the proper way of saying this? We don't say it this way. You guys forgot chapter nine or chapter ten already. What, how do, we don't use. We, don't, we always use Greek. We always put Greek letters into the hypotheses. Why are we putting Greek letters? Like you know, why do we put Greek letters into this thing? Yes. Right. In other words, what we we know what the average is. The average might be four point six. The average might be three point eight. The average might be. There's no question what the average is. The average is whatever, whatever the number is in front of your face. What the question we have is, in the whole population, what is the average of that population? So the, the hypothesis testing is always about population numbers. And the population average is mu. This already should look more familiar to everybody. So people who put down x bar would be partially wrong, but this is the mu is the right symbol. So what is B1? Is B1 based on the sample or is B1 based on the population? It's based on a sample of numbers. You know, you plug it all in, et cetera, et cetera. So where is the pop what's, what's the Greek letter that would correspond to the B1 that represents something about the population? Now, at this point, I don't, you know, I don't want you to guess because we didn't learn about it yet, or I said at the end of the last class. The answer is the following. If you would have a population, not just force, let's say, for example, this is McDonald's. And they found out how many McDonald's are there in the world? I don't know. Thousands, tens of thousands. So, and they want to know is the average. The more they put into advertising, the more sales they get for that particular local store. So, they took four stores. Just I don't know why they only took four of them, but they took four of them. But really, what you really want to know about is, let's say, the the forty thousand stores. Let's say there are forty thousand. Can it be forty thousand around the world? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Okay. Let's say four thousand stores around the world. All right. So if, now, if you graph the population. Not the sample, but you graph the McDonald's relationship between the advertising and sales in the whole population, where of course some stores sp spend much more than eight and some make a lot more than that. You're gonna get, instead of having four dots, now the population, you're gonna have 4,000 dots. And this, let's say, for argument's sake, represents the 4,000 dots that you're gonna get among the whole population. Now, of course, in real life, you never have the whole population. In the case of McDonald's, you can. I'm sure the central office knows all these numbers. But if you're measuring, for example, people's height and weight, you, don't, you only have, let's say, 100 people across the whole world. You don't have all 6 billion numbers. But, if, you know, but imagine this is 6 billion people's heights and weights, and we have a picture like that. Now, of course, in real life, it wouldn't be that nicely a straight line. But let's assume for argument's sake that it is a straight line like that. Then you fit a straight line through it. So now the equation will not be any more y equals b0 plus b1x. Now the equation is we're making an actual prediction for the y value. We're not just trying to fit the straight line. We're saying that theoretically speaking, the y is equal to, now it's a straight line, so there's going to be like a y equals mx plus b, but we're going to call it beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. That's the first thing. So the, so the b0 corresponds, let's go back to the original formula, y hat equals b0 plus b1x. So the beta 0, so the b0 essentially, and again, if you had the whole population in front of you, and you can, you're trying to figure out what is the real true amount of intercept for the whole millions of people, the whole population. So we don't know that number. We like to know that number for purposes of understanding all the data. But we calculate on our small sample, and we get b. So b0 is an estimate for beta 0. And b1 is an estimate for beta 1. And the problem is, as I tell to, told you last time, that this equation can't be right because this equation is claiming that any particular y value can be pr uh, predicted based on its x value by multiplying that number b1 and adding on to b0. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that is that the data clearly doesn't follow a perfect straight line. The, da the data is off the line. So in order to recognize the fact that the data is not perfectly a straight line, it's close to a straight line, in order to make the model, this is called the, the, model, of the, the model equation, we have to add another term to it to indicate the fact that now the y could truly be equal to the straight line plus a certain amount of error term. Epsilon stands for error, which in, if you want to see physically, it represents all these vertical lines, the, dis the distances between the straight line and the dot. 
Okay, so that's so that that's so the next part of the, the next part of the theory of the chapter, which I'm not, may, maybe may, I may not do right now, because I want to. We only have ten minutes, and I want to get to the main part of today's lecture, is to talk about what is that epsilon. I'm always. Well, how does the epsilon function? Does it, is it totally? It's random because sometimes a person is higher than it should be. Sometimes a person or a store is lower than it should be. So the epsilon is sort of random, but it's there in order to recognize the fact of life that the data doesn't fully follow a straight line. If we just stopped right over here, we'd be lying. We'd be making a, a you know, making a overly simplifying. In other words, mathematics tries to simplify nature, but as Einstein said, you don't want to overly simplify it because nature is somewhat complicated. So it does follow more or less a straight line, but that more or less is what the epsilon takes into account. All right, but I'm not going to talk about the epsilon. I just want to point it. But now, now that I said what I said, can somebody go back now and correct this, this, this slightly incorrect uh, somebody else, somebody else who hasn't talked, uh, talking up, talked up, spoken up. So now, because we don't really care about the B1, B1 we know happens to be 1.1. That's certainly not zero. But the question is, if I would do this in a larger population, B1 is merely, an, what is the beta one? So if, if saying the X and Y are not related is the same thing as saying that beta one is equal to zero, meaning the entire population. And likewise, the opposite of that is saying that beta one is not equal to zero. So the proper way of putting down the hypotheses for this next, for this answering this question in a formal way is beta one is zero, meaning they're not related, or beta one is not equal to zero. So that's step number one of the hypothesis testing four-step procedure. Step number two is always what? Yes, Diaz. Nope, let's go back to this. If I was asking you, the, we have a random number table, and we want to know, is this a good random number table or a bad random number table? So we say we do a hypothesis test, we take a sample of data, the X bar. If it's close to 4.5, we say we accept the H0. So, but how do we start off the whole process? We start off by saying H0, mu equal 4.5. So we're never analyzing, we're always analyzing the whole population. In other words, our ultimate goal in all of statistics is to know something about the whole population. But we always, recognize we can't have access to the whole population, so instead, we always take a relatively small sample. That, that applies in this case, it applies in the same thing here. We really want to know about what's the relationship between all the stores and all the advertising and all the sales. But we, don't, can't, we can't analyze all the stores in the world, we can just analyze maybe four of them or 30 of them or 100 of them. We can't analyze 25 million. So, so I hope I am, I'm answering your question. Okay, next. What is step number two of every hypothesis testing problem? Raise your hand if you want to answer it. Yes? Nope. That could be that could be step number two, but I just uh, my order was just to change. Yes? You do some calculation. In other words, step number one is you write down the hypothesis, usually some Greek letters. Step number two is you do a calculation with a formula. Step number three, you make a little graph, either the T diagram or the Q diagram or the chi square diagram or the F diagram or the Z diagram. Um, and then step number four is you make a little arrow indicating which side of the line you're on. So it's really very same procedure we've been doing since chapter nine. So now step number two is to make the diagram, the, the formula. Now the formula is going to be called T, which means in step number three we're going to go to the T diagram. That makes it nice and familiar to us. But what do you think the formula is? Now of course can, you can get the formula by looking in the book. You get the formula by, I don't know what else, but I'm asking you, what do you think would be in that formula? Like I always try to ask you, what, and what, what would you expect to see in that formula? Of all the symbols that we learned so far, what would you think will be in the, which is, well, what's gonna be the main part of that formula, Roger? What? The answer is the B1, because the B1 is our best guess for what the beta one. If B1 is equal to 37,000, it's pretty much not gonna be zero. If B1 is equal to 0. .0003, then maybe beta one. So B1 itself is the key number here, so that's very good. Do I have a... <coughs> Let me pass it back to um, Roger. So the formula starts out with the B1, but of course it's not as simple as just B1 by itself. That would be too easy. It has to do with what else? It has to do with the sample size. If anybody want to raise their hands, a sample size, that's almost too easy to say, because every formula has a sample size in it. What else do you think will be in that formula? Yes. The B0 is not really, remember I said, it doesn't make a difference. You know, which one of, well, we want to see if the lines are, the slope is zero or the slope is not zero. The actual height of this thing, the intercept, is really irrelevant. So the B0 turns out to be really irrelevant. I don't care if it's a high line. We really care about the angle, not, not how high or how low it is, okay? This view again. Yes, uh, somebody else, yes. The what? Wait, you mean the, X, the actual numbers, the X and the Y? 
we never we, ne- we never plug the, we never pl- 